turn to the second chapter of the Gospel of John. After the first 18 verses, which were a prologue, not part really of the historical narrative, but rather a theological interpretation of the life of Christ, telling us that he was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God, and then he was manifested in flesh and tabernacled with us, and not so much giving details of his life in the first 18 verses as giving, I guess we could say, the, the theological backstory to the life of Christ. Then, verses 19 through 51, the rest of chapter 1, really reported this, uh, the events of a series of four consecutive days. And when we looked at those, I pointed out that in some ways it's a little hard to harmonize them initially with the uh, stories in the Gospels, because on the first of those days, Actually, the first and the second of those days, John the Baptist points Jesus out in the crowd and tells the people that there's one among them who's greater than he is and retells a story of how he had baptized Jesus and seen the Holy Spirit come upon him in the form of a dove. And therefore, in verse 34, John says, I have seen and testified this is the Son of God. Now, the baptism of Jesus, therefore, is only mentioned in this gospel as a as a retrospect, as a memory of John the Baptist. The Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke record the baptism of Jesus in the course of narrative events. It tells of how Jesus came to John, was baptized, and then went into the wilderness, was tempted for 40 days, and then came back. Although the other Gospels skip immediately from the end of the temptation in the wilderness to the time when Jesus went to Galilee because John was put in prison. Now that's important because John was not yet put in prison in the time we're reading about. In fact, even into chapter 3, we are given notice that John was not yet put into prison. In chapter 3, verse 24, it says, For John had not yet been thrown in prison. And yet, all of the other Gospels resume the narrative from the temptation of Jesus. They skip over everything we're looking at at this point in John and begin the story when John was put in prison. So the gospel here, the fourth gospel, is filling in details that the others have left out of the early days between the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness, on the one hand, and the beginning of his Galilean crusade when John was put in prison. Because, like I said, the other gospels simply go from the temptation to the Galilean ministry when John was in prison. But here... It is clearly after the, after the baptism and after the temptation. And John now sees Jesus returning from the wilderness, apparently hanging out around the place where John was baptizing and pointing him out to people. This is the Son of God. This is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, he says. And on the third of these consecutive days, he said it again in verse 35. The next day, and this is the third one in sequence, John stood with two of his disciples and said, Behold the Lamb of God. And those two disciples, we are told one of them was Andrew, and he went and sought his brother Simon and brought him to Jesus. Simon then met Jesus, and Jesus said, I'm going to call you Cephas, or a rock. But now, your name will be not Simon, but Cephas, or Cephas. And this is the same word as Peter, or Petros. Petros is the Greek word for a rock. Kephas, or Cephas, is the Aramaic word for a rock. Same, same word in a different language. Um, but then there's a fourth day mentioned in verse 43 of chapter 1, and that is the day that Jesus called Philip. Now, the, the men who met Jesus the previous day to this were Andrew and Simon and an unnamed disciple, but since it is the pattern of the writer of this gospel to mention himself without giving his name, Sometimes just calling himself another disciple, or the other disciple, or a number of times the beloved disciple, or, or more properly, the disciple whom Jesus loved. This is the way the author speaks of himself, and therefore it is most likely that the unnamed disciple of the two who first heard John speak and followed Jesus on the third of these four days, the unnamed one was John, and therefore we could say that John and 
Simon Peter and Andrew all met Jesus on that day, but there is no record that they followed him in any permanent sense or that he expected them to. He saw them walking behind him. He said, what do you want? They said, where are you lodging? He says, follow me. I'll show you. He said, come, I'll show you. And it says they spent the rest of the day with him. It doesn't say they went beyond that. They spent the day with him. And then whatever they did after that is not recorded. But we found in the other Gospels that these same men and one other, John's brother James, were fishing in Galilee. And all the other Gospels record how that Jesus came alongside the Sea of Galilee, a, a very different location than this story took place in, much further north. And he sees these men fishing and he calls them and says, follow me. And then they come after him permanently. They become disciples. They become his followers. Since they did not apparently do so until he called them from their fishing nets. And that may have been almost a year after this. No one knows how long it was, but it was at least, no doubt, months after this. Uh, that means that these men had met Jesus around the place where John was baptizing, had spent an afternoon with him, and then no doubt had spent a lot of time contemplating who he was, the significance of that meeting, of John's words about him being the Lamb of God, while they fished. And apparently, uh, I would guess that they probably had conversations among themselves about him and, and maybe kind of wishing they had not let him get away, whoever he was. And then he shows up while they're fishing and they and so follow me and they, they're quick to comply because they're prime. They're, they've been probably thinking about him for months and uh, no doubt very happy to be called. So they leave their fishing nets and go with him. But that was a sequel to the third of these four days in chapter one. The fourth of these days he meets Philip and Philip goes and gets a friend of his name, Nathaniel, who is almost certainly the same man in the apostolic lists whose name is given as Bartholomew. The name Nathaniel is not found in any of the synoptic gospels, but he is mentioned a number of times in this gospel. Uh, but he's a friend of Philip's. In the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, when the apostolic lists are given of the twelve, associated with Philip is one named Bartholomew. And most evangelical scholars would say that Bartholomew is another name for Nathaniel. After all, the word Bartholomew means son of Tholomew. Bar means son of in Hebrew. So his name was probably Nathaniel Bar Tholomew. His dad's name was Tholomew, or a Hebrew form of the name Ptolemy. So uh, this Nathaniel, though he's not mentioned by that name in the other Gospels or in any of the apostolic lists, is probably the man Bartholomew who is in the apostolic lists. So Philip and Nathaniel become followers of Christ at this point and may have been the only two at this point who were actually, you know, traveling with him. Eventually many disciples were traveling with them and then he picked out 12 of them. That, that singling out of the 12 is never mentioned in John's Gospel because it's mentioned the others in John's Gospel almost uh, it studies to not duplicate what the other Gospels have said. So many important things in the other Gospels are left out of John simply because they are in the other Gospels and John is no doubt writing a supplementary account to them. So we never read in John of these men being called to be apostles or selected to be apostles, but we do read what we did not read in the synoptics, that Philip and Nathaniel are called to follow Jesus at least, as many, many people were. Many people followed Jesus, and some people were called specifically who didn't, as when Jesus called one man and the man said, let me first go bury my father. Or Jesus called another man and he said, uh, you know, um, let me go say goodbye to those in my household. And apparently begged off and begged out of, of going with Jesus. But there were a lot of people who followed Jesus. But the only two we know about at this stage that we're reading in, and when we come to chapter 2 are Philip and Nathaniel. But there could have been many more that, whose, whose call has not been mentioned specifically. And it says in chapter 2, on the third day. Now, in chapter 1, we've been accustomed to reading the phrase, the next day, the next day, the following day. And now we read the third day. 
Some people think the third day means the third day of the week, which on the Jewish calendar would be Tuesday, because Sunday is, even on our calendar, the first day of the week, and so the third day would be Tuesday. And that they think it's talking about that. Uh, seems more likely to me that since we've been reading about the next day, the next day, and the following day, that this is saying the third day from the previous one mentioned. And that, you know, three days later, in other words. It doesn't matter too much what it means, but it is a, it is a uh, chronological notice. Now, we're going to see that on this occasion, on the third day, we're going to be told that he manifested his glory. If you look down at verse 11, which is the end of this little section, it says, the begin This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cain of Galilee and manifested his glory. It's possible that John, being the mystical fellow that he tended to be more than the other gospel writers, might have intended the third day and Jesus manifesting his glory on the third day to be something of a uh, hint of his eventual resurrection on the third day and manifesting his glory. I say that partly because the second part of this chapter, this chapter has two significant stories. The, the one we're about to read is the, when Jesus turns water into wine. Then there's also the cleansing of the temple. In the second of these stories in this chapter, Jesus says, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And John tells us he was speaking about his body. So there are veiled references to uh, Jesus' resurrection on, on the third day, at least in the latter part of the chapter, and John may have done so here also. It's not too important for us to know whether he did, but it's a suggestion that might uh, repay some consideration. So the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Now, I want to say that I've heard people use this verse as a means of suggesting that the second coming of Christ should come about now. Of course, there's all kinds of ways people try to calculate that and make it seem like this is the time, and some of them more credible than others. But they suggest that a day to the Lord is like a thousand years. And therefore, after the year 2000, we are now in the third day. And there's a wedding in Cana. They say, see, the wedding feast of the Lamb is on the third day. So after the year 2000, of course, all that's extremely speculative, and I don't think there's anything hinted at about that here. For one thing, it's not Jesus getting married here, although the Mormons say it is. The Mormons say that this wedding feast was Jesus' own wedding, and that he was marrying Mary and Martha, the two sisters, although the law of Moses forbids a man to marry two sisters. Jacob did, but that was before the law. The law of Moses eventually made it illegal for a man, even if he could have two wives, he couldn't have two wives that were each other's sisters. And uh, the Mormons believe that here Jesus was marrying Mary and Martha and Mary Magdalene so that he was taking three wives. Uh, of course, this doctrine arose back when Mormons still believed in polygamy. They eventually had to abandon that practice under pressure from the U.S. government. So I, but they still have said this about this passage. However, it seems strange to me to suggest that in view of verse 2, it says now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. It strongly suggests it was not Jesus' own wedding, because it should go without saying that the groom would be invited to his own wedding. But it says in verse 1, there's a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. You know, she is mentioned uh, two other times, but she's never named in this gospel. This gospel never mentions her name. She's just referred to as the mother of Jesus. She's mentioned in chapter 6, verse 42, and she's mentioned in uh, 1925 and following too. But uh, Mary is with Jesus in some of these stories, and not Joseph. Joseph is not there. And we actually get the impression that Mary may have tra traveled with Jesus after this point, because in verse 12 it says, after this he went down to Capernaum, he, his mother, his brothers, and his disciples, and they did not stay there many days, but they did stay there at least some days, and Mary stayed with them, but not with her husband. Uh, the fact that John tells us in chapter 19 that Jesus from the cross, looking down and seeing his mother at the foot of the cross, standing next to the apostle whom Jesus loved, John, Jesus said to John, Behold your mother, and to his mother, Behold your son. 
And thus, it says, John took Mary under his charge from that point on, under his care. And so he took care of Mary from that time on. Hardly would seem necessary if she was still married, uh, so she must have been widowed by this time. Uh, and that seems possibly to be the case as early as in this story, which is you know, more than two years prior to the crucifixion. But it would appear that Joseph died sometime in the interim after Jesus was 12. We know Joseph was in that story in Luke chapter 2 when Jesus was 12 at the temple. But we never hear of Joseph again chronologically after that point. So sometime between Jesus age 12 and Jesus age 30, it would appear that Joseph had died, having served the purpose for which he was born. And that is to rear the, the, the minor child, Jesus, and to care for him, a, a very privileged position. But having fulfilled it, after Jesus was 12, really, uh, a boy at that age was bar, bar mitzvah and was not considered to be that dependent anymore. Jesus still lived at home and served as a carpenter, but uh, apparently God took Joseph home sometime after that, and now in Jesus' adult life, he's traveling at times with his mother, who is among the disciples. But she was not always traveling with him, because in the synoptics we read of a story where Jesus was surrounded by a great crowd, and Mary came from Galilee, from their hometown, to where Jesus was, wishing to take him aside and speak to him, and he wouldn't grant her an audience, but it's clear she was not a disciple at that moment. But in the early days, she was, he and she were still uh, hanging out together pretty much, it looks like. So the mother of Jesus was at the wedding. In fact, the way she kind of takes charge of things, one might get the impression uh, that it was at least a relative of the family who was being married, and that's not a bad assumption. We couldn't be sure, but uh, she was at least very familiar to the household and could give orders to the servants. And she might have been in some way, you know, she might have been the sister of the mother of the bride or the groom or something. And, and so this was a family wedding in all likelihood. We can't, it's not important for us to know for sure. And it says in verse 2, Now Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Now, Je Jesus was approached by the, the running out of wine. And you might wonder how it is that a wedding would run out of wine. Did they have more guests than they expected? Or, or something like that. But Really, it was hard to calculate how much wine you'd need because a wedding feast would go sometimes two weeks long. And, you know, you can't easily calculate how many people are coming and going and how much wine you'll need. So it must have not been very unusual for a family to run out of wine, especially if they were not upper class. Um, Jesus and his family were of a peasant class, and very possibly the whoever was putting on the wedding had limits to how much they could afford to to serve wine. Now, wine was absolutely necessary at any uh, festive occasion, or frankly, at any meal. There are many people who, be because it is their view that Christians should never touch alcohol, have said that Jesus on this occasion did not turn water into wine, but he turned water into grape juice. Uh, because there's a strong aversion to uh, giving permission to Christians to drink any alcohol on the part of some people. Many Pentecostals take this view. I was raised in a Baptist church. They took the view that a Christian should not uh, ever drink any alcohol. And people like that really kind of get uncomfortable with a story like this because Jesus made a lot of wine. And so many times people who are against drinking altogether say, well, Jesus couldn't have made alcoholic wine because with that volume of wine, certainly some people would have drunk too much and gotten drunk, and then Jesus would have become responsible for them sinning by becoming drunk. Well, you might as well say that God is responsible for people getting drunk because he made <laughs> wine in the first place. Or that God is responsible for people being gluttons because he made food. Just because God provides something good 
it doesn't mean that the abuse of it falls on his shoulders as his responsibility. Uh, there are proper and improper uses of food and drink. And uh, in, in the Bible, actually, in Proverbs chapter 31, the advice is given to give wine to someone who is in agony and, and perishing, apparently as an anesthesia for someone who's suffering in a day when they didn't have any other options. Remember the old westerns where a guy had gangrene in his leg and they had to saw it off with a wood saw? And so they just gave him, you know, a pint of vodka to numb the pain. From watching it, it didn't sound like it numbed it completely, but uh, it was apparently the best they had. And for probably many centuries, the best you could do to uh, anesthetize someone who's in excruciating pain was to do them the favor of giving them alcohol. God made it for something. I mean, it was not alcohol. We, I don't think we should say alcohol is the result of the fall. But drunkenness is. And anyone who's got a problem holding their alcohol or drinking it in moderation should certainly stay away from it. And it's probably a good idea for people who don't have a problem to stay away from it when they're around people who do have a problem with it. But the point is to make a law that because some people abuse a substance, that substance just is evil or, or Christians shouldn't be near it or touch it, is a little bit like, uh, it reminds me of Eve. When the devil said, has God said you should not eat of every tree of the garden? And she said, well, we can eat of all the trees of the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God has said we should not eat of that one lest we die, nor shall we touch it. Now, obviously, God didn't say they shouldn't touch it. He said they shouldn't eat it. If you're not supposed to eat something, it's probably a good idea not to touch it because if you start handling it, you might just tempt yourself. And so it's not bad advice. If you're not supposed to eat it, it's a good idea not to touch it either. But that's not what God said. And when you start adding, putting it, building a hedge around the law, and God said this, but we'll go further and say more than he did, then you're, that's, that's the origin of legalism. The Bible does say that we should not get drunk, that it's a, it's a work of the flesh. Even drunkards are mentioned twice in lists of people who will not inherit the kingdom of God. So obviously drunkenness is not okay, but that's not the same thing as saying all consumption of alcohol is not okay, because not all consumption of alcohol leads to drunkenness. And since there are people who are weak toward drink and can't handle it, then obviously, like I said, they should stay away from it. Uh, just like Paul said, all things are lawful to me, but I will not be brought into bondage to anything. Uh, he was talking about food in that case, but that would be true of anything. That is itself lawful, but which you don't want to have it run away with you. Now, did Jesus make alcoholic wine? Why not? He didn't drink over much of it. He didn't get drunk. His disciples, I'm sure, didn't. Did anyone get drunk there? Maybe. We don't know. Is it his responsibility if they did? No. God made everything. And everything that's abused by people, God made. But he's not responsible for the way they abuse it. He made good things only. We know that the early church did not have these scruples about avoiding alcohol because at communion they had alcoholic wine. We know. Paul said when it was abused at the communion table in Corinth, some went away drunk. Can't get drunk on grape juice no matter how much you drink. It was alcohol. So, and I say this not as one who's interested in, uh, you know, encouraging alcohol consumption. I'm not much of a, a drinker of alcohol myself. I, uh, I, but tr truth is I don't care for alcohol enough to walk across the street to get a drink. I just have never been attracted to the stuff, but, but I'm not attracted to legalism either. And I just don't like people abusing scripture because they have a weakness themselves. I think uh, it's, it's good to say that anything that will lead a person into sin is something they should avoid. Just like Jesus said, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out, cast it from you. If you've got a problem with something, then keep it out of your life. But don't tell other people that they have to if they don't have that problem. And, and there's no bit, you know, when people begin to twist the scripture to make it wrong for everybody to do the thing that they themselves don't feel right doing. That's, that's legalism. It's interesting that when Jesus turned water to wine on this occasion, that the master of ceremonies at the feast did not know where it came from. And he went to uh, the host and he says, you know, most people... They wait for everyone to be drunk 
on the better wine, and then they bring out the cheap wine when no one can tell the difference. But you've kept the best wine till now. Now, if what they're accustomed to is wine that has alcohol in it, enough to get them drunk enough that they can't tell the difference between good and bad wine afterwards, then it would seem strange if Jesus provided grape juice and the man said, wow, this is the best wine of the whole feast. <laughs> Seems like he'd notice it was grape juice. But they ran out of wine because wine had to be used in the Middle East in ancient times to purify the water. Everybody drank wine, but they usually diluted it with water, or more properly, they purified the water with a bit of wine. They had a jug of water and a jug of wine at the table. We know this from the writings of the Latin uh, writers of the period and from the Talmud of the Jews and also the Greek writers. It's, it's a universal, well-known custom that when you, you know, live in a land where the water is not guaranteed safe, you do something to fix it. And what they did generally was put wine in it. Usually one part wine to two parts water, or sometimes one part wine to three parts water. That's, that's the formula that you read about in the ancient Roman and Greek historians. So that was enough alcohol to kill whatever little nasty living things were in the water and make it potable and safe to drink without getting amoebic dysentery. But it was hardly enough, I mean, you could hardly drink enough of it to get drunk unless you drank wine unmixed. From time to time, the Bible makes reference to wine unmixed. As, for example, in, Isaiah, in Revelation 14, when it says, Those who worship the beast and take the number of, not, of his name shall drink of the cup of God's indignation, which is poured into the, uh, or shall drink of the wrath of God, which is poured into the cup of his, poured unmixed into the cup of his indignation, it says. It specifically refers to wine being unmixed, meaning full strength. Why well, mention that? Because usually they did mix it. It was un Unmixed wine was an unusual thing. If a person wanted to get drunk, of course he could drink unmixed wine, but everybody drank wine in their water. Just, it was the only way to be safe. And so they always had wine at every table, and it was alcoholic wine. It wouldn't do any good if it wasn't. So they, they needed more wine. And Mary somehow was privy to the fact that they had run out. Again, making me think it's likely that she might have been a relative of the, of the person's putting on the wedding. We don't know what kind of relative, but how would she come into knowledge of this embarrassing little factoid? Which, I mean, she came to Jesus privately about it. I'm sure it wasn't being spoken broad. I'm sure no one got up made the announcement we've run out of wine, folks. It would actually be extremely embarrassing to have invited your guests and have it come out that you had not prepared properly for them or anticipated every need. Uh, and especially for a poor family, it would be especially embarrassing to have to admit we couldn't afford enough wine for all the people we invited. And so Mary, who feels the embarrassment for the hosts, comes to Jesus and just tells him about the problem. Now because Jesus actually went and did something about it, we might assume that she was asking Jesus to do something. And if so, we might ask, what did she expect him to do? We know that Jesus ended up doing a miracle, but we're actually told it was his first miracle, which means she had never seen him do a miracle before and probably wasn't of the mind to expect that. Eventually, after Jesus was known for his miracles, people came to expect miracles. But when Jesus had never done one, and Mary had raised him in her home for 30 years and never seen a miracle done by him, it's not likely that she thought the first miracle he would do would be make wine for a wedding. She might not have even known at this point that he would have the power to do miracles since he had never done any. So why did she even come to him about it? I think this is just a very true to life little glimpse into the uh, normal family life of, of, the, of Jesus and his mother and his brothers and so forth. That Jesus we know is the oldest child of a relatively large family, perhaps not very large by the standards of the time. But Jesus had four brothers, so he was the oldest of five boys, and he had some sisters. The number of sisters is not given, but it's in the plural, so there were at least two sisters. It could have been ten. 
But we know there were at least seven children in that family, Jesus being the oldest. He was Mary's firstborn, we're told in Scripture. Now, Joseph being dead, and Jesus being probably the most responsible, as well as the oldest child, certainly most reliable. Jesus was your child, I think you'd find very soon that he was very reliable and uh, very conscientious. I'm sure that with her husband dead, she had become accustomed in the household to approach Jesus, especially since he's almost 30 years old. Probably the oldest child, she came to him about all the, all the issues of concern in, the, in her household and probably just habitually did that so that now that they're in somebody else's household, she learns a problem, she, what to do? Let's, I'll tell Jesus about it. Maybe he can figure something out. Maybe he and his disciples can take up a collection when themselves and run out and buy some wine somewhere. Or whatever. We don't know what she expected him to do. Or even if she expected him to do anything at all. Maybe she was just unloading on him. She's embarrassed for the, you know, embarrassed for the host and wants to share her, you know, her, uh, thinks Jesus would be sympathetic, though she may or may not have thought he would do anything. And he then responded strangely, it would seem. He said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Now that actually has a rather rude sound to it, to our ears, but not so much to hers. To address a woman as woman was very commonplace. There are others that Jesus spoke of as woman with great compassion. Uh, like the woman who, the Syrophoenician woman whose daughter had a demon and she was begging Jesus to come and heal him, and, and finally he said, O oh woman, great is your faith. Be it done to you even as you've desired. To, to address a woman as woman was normal, and to address a man as man. Jesus sometimes would address a man as man. So while we don't do that, and when if you speak to a woman call her woman, usually there's a note of severity or a note of maybe... Uh, rebuke or something in that. That wasn't necessarily the case. It's, it'd be similar to saying, Madam, or my lady, my good lady, or something like that. Of course, men don't speak that way to their mothers generally, but it was not a rude way of speaking. And But he said, what does your concern have to do with me? Now again, this almost sounds like, what do I care about your issues? But <laughs> in all likelihood, he's saying, you, you know, this is a concern of yours. What is it you think I'm supposed to do about it. And how does this become my problem? <laughs> <laughs> and he says, my hour is not yet come. Now, there's many references in the Gospel of John to Jesus' hour. Usually, it says his hour had not yet come, or his time had not yet come. Most of the time when Jesus said, my hour is not yet come, or when the author, John, says that Jesus' hour had not yet come, it's referring to the hour of his death. But that doesn't make a lot of sense here, because nothing Mary had said had made reference to his death. Uh, I mean, it was, it was, I'm of the opinion that what he means here is simply, uh, I'm on a different schedule than yours. If you could do something right now, you'd do it. But that doesn't mean it's my time to do anything. I'm not taking my orders from you. I'm on another person's agenda, which would be namely my father's agenda. One reason I think that it means that is because he said something kind of similar to his brothers in chapter 7. In chapter 7, verse 2, it says, Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. And apparently they said this with a note of sarcasm, not, not sincerity, because it says in verse 5, for even his brothers did not believe in him. But Jesus said to them, my time, this time it's my time, not my hour, but same idea, my time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. That is, you're not on anyone else's schedule. You can do whatever you want, whenever you want to. I have to do things on my father's program, my father's schedule. My time isn't yet, but you, your time is any time. So what he's saying is, I'm not at my own liberty 
to do just whatever I want or whatever you want me to do. I have a schedule that is set up by somebody higher than you and higher than me, my father. What he wants is what I have to do. And so when he said that to his brothers, it reminds me of what he said to his mother here. My hour has not yet come, or my time in, 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 by implication. And so it sounds like he's taking her comment as an implicit request to do something. And he's trying to say to her in a maybe gentle or maybe not so gentle way, Mom, I have been at your beck and call for these 30 years I've been in your household, but I've left home now. <laughs> I'm on someone else's schedule. You can't just assume it's going to be like it was all those years, that you just come to me whenever the toilet's clogged and I jump and, and get a plumber. You know, I mean, every time there was something wrong, probably Mary had come to him, and she was used to him just being available whenever she asked for something. Because it says in Luke chapter 2, that after that event when Jesus was 12 years old, it says he went down to Nazareth with them and was subject to them, meaning to Mary and Joseph. So the whole time Jesus lived at home until he was about 30, he was subject to his mother. And what she said was his, you know, he's, he's a good son, honor your father and mother. He was subject to her. He'd do what she said. She was accustomed to that. No doubt he saw her comment as implying, you know, son, do something about this. They're out of line. Is there anything you can do? And Jesus is just trying to put her essentially in her place, not in a not in a negative sense, but in the sense of let her know that there's a change of of his uh, itinerary now. He's not going to follow what she or any other human being wants him to do. His hour is going to be determined by a higher authority. And I think that's what it means. What does your concern have to do with me? Is a rhetorical question. It means that. You know, I can't let your concerns dominate my agenda. I, you know, I have to really go by somebody else's agenda right now. And this is not my time to do anything. Now, we do read that, you know, almost the next thing we read is that he did something. But we don't know how much time elapsed before he did. And uh, he may have just let enough time elapse to make sure he wasn't doing it just at her request, I mean, God may have said, okay, now do something. And it's the same thing over in John 7 when we're talking about that other case with his brothers. Because his brother said, go to Jerusalem and show yourself. He said, well, you can do it whenever you want to. My time is not ready. But he then said uh, in verse 8, John 8, uh, 7, 8, you, he says to his brothers, you go up to this feast. I'm not yet going up to this feast. For my time is not yet fully come. But it says, when he had said these things to them, he remained in Galilee. But when his brothers had gone up, he also went up to the feast. How much later than that? We don't know. It makes it sound like he just waited for them to get out of sight around the next bed, then he snuck off. But uh, actually, he was, he was mindful of when the right time was. And he says, I'll go when it's the right time for me. And he did. And the way the story is told, we don't have any gap told between the time he says, I'm not going yet. And then the time he actually goes, it sounds like it's immediately after. Same thing here. He says to his, his mother, I, uh, I can't just do things because you want me to. I'll do it on my father's schedule. And that might have been an hour later, two hours later. We don't know. But the story jumps, of course, to the sequel where he does step in and do something. But when Jesus said this to his mother, she didn't seem to be taken aback. She just rolls with it. And verse 5 John 2, 5, his mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now, just because she could order the servants doesn't mean it was her household. Servants were sort of not free people, sort of like slaves in a household, and they probably were accustomed to, you know, fulfilling the request of any notable person or any, you know, person who was not a slave who gave, asked them to do something. So she commissioned the slaves to keep track of Jesus and do whatever he might instruct them to do. 